everybody, real fast before the kill count, just want to let you know that They Talk is returning to Dead Meat, season two, created by this man, Zorn Gavoyage, coming to you on Sunday, January 28th. And until then, you can check out some special standalone shorts that I've done just for the Dead Meat socials. Yeah, watch those. Yeah, see you there. Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies and show you how they were made. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Evil Dead Rise, released in 2023. This is the fifth film of the Evil Dead franchise, coming out 10 years after the previous installment. While the 2013 movie was often called a reboot, Rise loosely places it in the same universe as the original trilogy, and Ash vs. Evil Dead, the three-season series on stars. Evil Dead Rise continues the franchise tradition of combining dark humor and serious gore. At the same time, it's different and unique in a lot of ways. Instead of a cabinet the woods, it takes place in a high-rise apartment building. And instead of a bunch of friends who have no personalities, with some of them kind of having it coming, this time we follow a sweet little family who have to band together against the forces of evil. You don't turn on each other. Ever. But this is the evil dead we're talking about, and those nasty deadites don't give a fuck about your family. That's why I don't mind that the first act of Rise is occasionally sappy, even outright corny at times. Look, Mom, I'm a bad it's a worthy setup to make the later carnage more impactful. And while the gore may not be as extreme as the stuff in the 2013 version, it's still pretty gnarly and fun to watch. You know, if you're a sick fuck. Evil Dead Rise was produced by the men who created the franchise in the first place. Sam Raimi, Bruce Campbell, and Rob Tappert. But they gave a lot of leeway to writer-director Lee Cronin, an Irish filmmaker who had worked with Raimi on his Quibi series Fifty Shades of Fright. Cronin's balance of sincere characters and characteristically sinister deadites gives us another awesome Evil Dead entry, especially with an all-time performance by Alyssa Sutherland as Mommy. Sorry, Mommy? Sorry, Mommy? Sorry. Will the body count rise high? James. Like, Jesus. Oh, thank God I found you, man. Here, I need you to translate this for me. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little busy right now, man. I'm doing the kill... Also, this is in English already. Okay, well, please, here, just do it for me. Or do it for today's sponsor, Manscaped. Well, I do love Manscaped. All right, let's see here. Two interchangeable skin safe blade heads, the skin safe trimmer blade, and skin safe foil blade? Oh! This is about the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. It's Manscaped's latest innovation in grooming technology. The trimmer blade cuts through hair with ease, all while being gentle on the skin. Then comes the foil blade, designed to get in nice and close, gliding gently over the skin and capturing even the finest hairs. Yes, yes, I know all of this. Keep reading. Go, go! All right. Sure, calm down. Um, let's see. Uh, rechargeable Lion battery, travel lock, USB-C charging, three-level battery life indicator, LED light. Oh, hey, that's another one of the 5.0 upgrades. Yeah, with a bigger light than the 4.0, even those hard-to-reach areas are perfectly lit. What? Is that all? Yeah, I think so. Oh, oh, it's waterproof. Yeah, it's waterproof, too. Yes. Yes! <laughs> Zorin! Z oh, hey! Damn it! I was supposed to never be without a lawnmower, not become. Huh. I don't think he's been properly charged. You don't need to invoke dark magic, though. You can go to manscaped.com and get your hands on the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra today. Plus, when you use code KILLCOUNT20, you get 20% off, plus free international shipping. Will the body count rise high when deadites take over a high rise? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins in classic Evil Dead style, with the first demon perspective shot racing through the woods and over some water. But turns out this time it's a drone, because getting these shots nowadays is a lot easier than it was in 1979 when they filmed the first movie. Back then, the camera was literally mounted to a wooden board and the cam op carried over swamps by two other dudes. A few kids are having a weekend getaway at an A-frame cabin in the woods, way different than the hunting cabin the series is used to. I just hope it wasn't rented from a Swedish cult. One of them, Jessica, is sick. Sick with spoilers, because she starts ruining Wuthering Heights for her cousin Teresa. Till the blood ran down and soaked the bed clothes. I love that the Deadites are still keeping up with their favorite magic tricks. Four of hearts, eight of spades, jack of clubs. <laughs> Jessica starts puking up, uh, I don't know, but whatever it is, it confirms that she's been permanently possessed by deadites, which for this series counts as a kill. She straight up scalps her cuz, who runs outside to the dock where Jessica's boyfriend Caleb is still droning on. Jessica grabs it and slices at her face in an action foreshadowed mere moments earlier. It wouldn't have been a clean decapitation with these blades. 
you just scramble your face up real good. Then she jumps into the lake and appears to drown, but we all know it's just a joke. Deadites are funny like that. Caleb takes the bait and ends up chum beneath the water, his death confirmed by his head being tossed onto the dock. The still living Teresa is treated to a show of Jessica's newest trick, levitating and ushering in the world's greatest title card. Seriously, they don't get better than this. Fuck yeah! The rest of the movie takes place one day earlier, in a Los Angeles high-rise shot in a way that reminds me of the one from Child's Play. The place is about to be torn down in a month, so there are only a few residents still living there. Among them is Ellie Bixler, a struggling mother whose husband recently left the family. She works as a tattoo artist to provide for her three kids. Bridget, the oldest, is a budding activist who doesn't want to join neighbor boys Jake and Scott for their Nightmare on Elm Street marathon. Mom's on nights and we're watching all the Freddy movies in a row. Even the shitty ones. There aren't any shitty ones. Well. One, that is absolutely not true, unless maybe they're not counting the remake. But also, this continues the long line of Raimi and Wes Craven references in each other's films. It started with a torn poster for The Hills Have Eyes in the original Evil Dead, continued with a scene from The Evil Dead playing in the original Nightmare on Elm Street, and was followed up with a Freddy glove in The Evil Dead 2 work shed. Middle Kid Danny is an aspiring DJ who you know is cool because he's blaring LCD sound system. Got this place sounding like my college party house. And finally, the youngest, Cassie, is a cutesy precocious artsy type who's latest macabre creation is Stephanie, which is the greatest pun for a Sid from Toy Story creation I've ever heard. These siblings like each other. Oh, that's nice. Unlike Ellie and her sister, Beth. You bitch. Oh, that's not nice. Beth is a touring guitar tech whom Ellie constantly calls a groupie. Come on, Elle, she's crew. That makes her a roadie. Get it right. In any case, she's here because she's pregnant. She found out as a girl at the rock show. She was like, what? But the pregnancy test didn't say no. She wants help from her sister, even though she normally can't even be arsed to pick up the phone. I mean, she hasn't even listened to the voicemails Ellie left two and a half months ago about her husband leaving her and the kids. He believes paying child support equals co-parenting from afar. Wow, sounds like a deadbeat by dawn. The sisters commiserate and make amends while the kids go out for some pizza. After they get back, they're hit by, oh God, are these deadite graboids? Deadoids? They're uh, grabites? Thankfully, no, it's just a standard earthquake. Although it's a hungry one trying to scarf down that pizza. Om, nom, 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 nom. Or maybe it wanted a better look at the reference on the box. It's Henrietta's pizza, a nod to the cellar deadite in Evil Dead 2. Thanks to the quake, there's a hole on the ground that DJ Danny Spelunker hops right into. This building used to be a bank, but inside its vault is more than just bank stuff. There's also religious stuff like Jesus Christ. Oh, hey, Jesus Christ. They also find some vinyl, but no Dylan, drag, and a big old buggy book with glowing veins. Danny hopes it could be valuable and help their family out. You think it might be worth something? Yeah, I'd say at least five movies in a TV show. The quake knocked out cell service, but the kids still get upstairs and reunite with their mom in the hallway. This corridor is the only floor we ever see in the high rise, giving us a much smaller setting than the new locale might have suggested. All these interiors were built on a soundstage by production designer Nick Bassett and his team. This is gonna be a corridor where a hell of a lot of important shit is gonna happen. He dressed the family's apartment set with more details than any viewer would ever see, making it feel like a lived-in space and even helping out the actors a bit. You could open up drawers and you would find like little hidden pieces of your character in their past and their history. As for the high-rise exterior, additional floors were digitally added to an existing four-story building. Danny goes to his room, excited for silent reading time, even though Bridget thinks the book could be trouble. I mean, yo, that thing's got teeth. Maybe don't. Ah, uh, yep, you got blood on the book. Good job. And it's drinking it? Great! The blood springs the Venus lit trap and gets things way too spooky for Bridget. Danny, please close it. But Danny doesn't. Damn it, Danny! Until she has to slam it shut herself. She gets him to promise not to read the book, but she ain't say shit about listening to records. So Danny whips out the vinyls he grabbed from the vault. Yo, DJ, spin that track! Good afternoon, my fellow clergyman. Fuck yeah, I love Clergy 5. Further listening reveals this some heavy metal church shit, with the preachers on the record arguing over this very book. Naturum de Monta. The book of the dead. To move the franchise out of Cabins in the Woods, Raimi and Co. decided to connect future installments through the Necronomicon. It really is about the, the books now, which are allegedly three books, so it's, where is that darn book now? Director Lee Cronin suggested that all three Necronomicons seen in Army of Darkness are legit. The original trilogy and TV series follows the first book, Fede Alvarez's 2013 version follows the second, and Evil Dead Rise unleashes the third. This book to me is one that has a certain amount of character and a little bit of life to it, uh, in the sense that it actually activates, it moves, it it drinks a little bit of blood. Cronin also wanted to add an explicitly religious element for the first time, since he figured the Catholic Church would love to try fixing something as evil as the Book of the Dead. And they had a ball with it. They loved that book. They loved that book. They fiddled big. Oh, actually, yeah, they played around that book a lot. <laughs> In 1923, this B.O.D. ended up at St. Patrick's Cathedral, where there was debate over whether or not they should translate it. Destroy it! It's called the Book of the Dead for a reason! That's 
That's a voiceover cameo from Bruce Campbell, which Cronin says is meant to be Ash trapped in another time. Poor guy. Despite his warnings, the bookkeeper translated the words anyway. Kanda. Once the spiritual resurrection passages start, Danny's unable to stop the record. It's self-spinning, spitting out spells, and scheduling Danny's mom for a Zoom meeting with the damned. The evil spirit rockets her to the roof of the elevator and gives her the most intense Tower of Terror ride ever. Aw, oh, but damn, she ain't gonna get the scenes with Star-Lord. The unseen demons lacerate her lobes, and if you listen closely, they're playing the hits. Sound designer Peter Albrechtson paid homage to the first two films by looping in some of the original digitized sound effects. <laughs> The Deadites then send a strongly worded cable, but Ellie fights to survive the hanging like she were in a challenge on Jigsaw Survivor. The cables contort her into a family-friendlier reference to the original's infamous tree scene, and ultimately leave her looking like Mario mid-jump. Look what you and your incessant DJing did, Danny. Let this be a lesson, Cody. This could happen to you. She gets back to the apartment, walking all kinds of funny. She starts cooking omelets, making them extra crunchy, and telling her family sweet stories of love. It was the perfect day. And all I could think about was how much I wanted to cut you all open and climb inside your body so that we could stay one happy family. Ellie then gets crawly and creepy with some extreme yoga and coughs up a whole bunch of bile. Oh, now where have I seen that before? Oh yeah, Jessica! That means Ellie's possessed and we can safely put her on the count. Before she's entirely gone, she gives one last urgent plea to Beth. Don't let her take my babies. No pressure. The family's unable to get off their floor since the elevator's mocking them and the stairs are, uh, not stairs anymore. This is the high-rise version of the bridge curled into destruction in the first couple of films. This family is trapped in the forest now, stuck with a deceased mom. Man, that sound effect. This movie's hilarious. I know some people wanted this to be another Evil Dead 2013 with relentless extreme gore. I get it, I like that movie too. But Evil Dead Rise has its own tone, which I respect, and brings a dark sense of humor back to the franchise. On the horror humor spectrum, I'd put it somewhere between the first two films, with 2013 and Army of Darkness on the outer limits. Beth turns to the neighbors for help, whom we met a little earlier, good guy Gabe and surly cat owner Crosby Fonda. They join Beth in honoring Ellie with a prayer slash Comedy Central roast. What the hell happened to her? face. Rest in peace. Looks like someone beat her up. Lisa Lampanelli about to talk about all the dicks Ellie sucked. Good thing she won't hear it, since she's so dead she's got flies on her eyes. Oh shit, never mind! Ellie's suddenly awake with a fever, and the only prescription is more bathtub. Too bad tubby time gets her tripping so bad she starts spider momming onto the ceiling. Then she lets out a scream so loud it violates everyone's security deposit. Once she finally cools off, Ellie's able to use her words like a big demon. Mommy's with the maggots now. Ellie is played by Alyssa Sutherland, a former model who brings an incredible physicality to the film's central deadite. The mastery she has over her body gives us what is possibly the best deadite possessed performance of the entire franchise. Franchise. It took two and a half hours every morning for makeup and prosthetics supervisor Luke Pulte to turn her into a deadite, but she developed the portrayal much earlier in her quarantine hotel room, using the best and most unlikely inspiration. I watched um, The Mask, Jim Carrey and The Mask, I sort of added a little, <laughs> a little sort of hilarity and joy and um, like a celebration of just Carnage. You can really see that influence in her movements later on. Ellie gets the party started by stabbing Beth in the hand and taunting her kids. I'm free now. Free from all you titty sucking parasites. She pins Bridget with a tattoo needle and gets started on a tasteful teardrop until Danny intervenes with a steel chair. By God. She tries picking the next person to eeny meeny miny KO when neighbors Jake and Gabriel walk in and accidentally volunteer themselves. Ellie chases them into the hall and bites out Gabriel's eye that spits it straight into Jake's mouth where it chokes him to death. If there's one thing deadites love more than killing, it's homage. In fact, every character here is named after an actor in the original trilogy. The Bixler family after Denise Bixler, Ellie after Ellen Sandweiss, Beth after M. Beth David, Bridget and Mr. Fonda after Bridget Fonda, Danny after Danny Hicks, and Cassie after Cassie Wesley DePava. Beth and the kids lock Ellie out, giving them a front row seat to a peephole theater murder show. They watch as neighbor kid Scott loses his arm and is tossed against a wall, Gabriel gets his throat ripped out anamorphically, and Mr. Fonda's guts are spilled. Well, they hear that last one more than they see it, but we do get plenty of visual confirmation of all this slaughter later. The just murdered Crosby Fonda is played by Mark Mitchinson, who also voiced the priest on the phonographs Danny listened to. He 
He also played another character named Crosby in one episode of Ash vs. Evil Dead. I don't know if he's meant to be the same guy or if there's a multiverse thing going on, but either way, RIP this time, dude. Bridget starts to surmise that maybe her bro's responsible for all this. Don't you think mom looks just like one of those pictures from that book? Danny reluctantly shows Beth the book as Bridget tries to hide her dead-eyed acne. Wow, her cheeks popping open like it were a spider hotel. Instead of spiders, though, it's black bile. And pretty soon, she's leaking out of, uh, everywhere. Hopefully it's just a bug, or many. Little Cassie's all alone by the front door, looking through the peephole that Mommy Theorist outside. Well, there you are. I love how even though deadites are super powerful and maybe omniscient, they're still blocked by simple physical barriers and have to manipulate people to get past doors. Nothing a big ol' hug and kiss from you won't fix. Open up now. The pleading works on Cassie, who unlocks the door enough for Mommy to give her throat a hug. Danny and Beth intervene, keeping the L problem back out, only to realize they've got a B problem inside. Beth finds Bridget possessed in the kitchen, chowing down on a wine glass. Ha, <laughs> stupid teenagers. They do not know how to drink. Beth tries to flee, but accidentally passes the cheese grater to Bridget, who doesn't wait for her to say when. The cheese grater was talked about a lot before the movie's release, but for all its hype, I've gotta say it. Not enough leg cheese for me. Beth says, no, chef! So Bridget turns her attention to Cassie, for forgetting about the kid's secret weapon, the old doll head murder stick. Cassie and Stephanie win this round. I think their next match is against Al Snow and Head. Beth comforts Cassie about ostensibly killing her sister and finds out she might make a good mom after all. You know how to lie to kids. Cassie is played by nine-year-old Nell Fisher. Cronin had her play with pretend viscera to get her comfortable, but sounds like she was just fine with all the blood and guts. When I got asked what scene I was looking forward to the most, straight away I said the elevator scene because it doesn't want to be covered in blood. Beth gets back to the book and rigs up some juice for the turntable using her roadie skills. Ha, <laughs> let's see a groupie do that. She starts with a record that Danny never listened to, the third album. That's the one with Immigrant Song, right? I make this final recording as a warning to whoever this comes into contact with the malignant pages. Probably should have labeled the warning album as number one, dude. The recording says the book can't be destroyed, so it should just be buried deep below the Earth's surface. Hmm, kinda like it was, Danny! As Beth binges the rules of dead-eyed kill counting, Ellie takes a hint from Mr. Fonda's cat. <coughs> Don't worry, nothing bad happens to the kitty. At least in the movie that was filmed. Early screenplay drafts had the cat turn into a dead-eyed and get eaten by Ellie. Isn't that awful, Lucy? So now they've got a deadite mom in the vents and a deadite sister creeping behind them. Bridget jump scares Danny, just like you do in a sibling rivalry. Ha, <laughs> the blood puking prank. My sister used to hit me with that one all the time. She's fucking up his gains hard when he manages to fight back with flames and give us a bitchin' fire stunt. Hell yeah. Beth is none the wiser until Ellie sneaks in and steals her job as the family audio technician. <laughs> Then it's on like Donkey Kong! Or more specifically, like a barrel from Donkey Kong. Beth lands next to Danny just in time to watch as he bleeds out to death. His last words are apologizing to his only remaining sister. A lot of familial final words here. It's, it's kind of sad. Of course, the Deadites have words for us too. I will swallow your soul. Man, these soul swallowers never stop. Ellie's sniffing at Beth's belly when Cassie passes her a pair of scissors. Beth tells her sister she needs to cut it out. Haha, <laughs> get Kool-Aid! You ought to know! Beth is played by Lily Sullivan, best known for starring in the TV adaptation of the Aussie classic Picnic at Hanging Rock. She landed this role with an audition so brief, Cronin forgot to ask a very important question. He found out later on that I couldn't scream. Like, I can't, this, this, this I don't have heaps of vocal range in that way. Yeah, I actually noticed that. <laughs> But only because I have a hard time screaming too. Sullivan took the mantle of Evil Dead heroine seriously, hitting up the gym to carry the metaphorical and also real chainsaw. But seriously though, actually fitness wise to do an Evil Dead film, it's like- Physicality. Film, it's, a, it's a real thing. The franchise is notorious for being physically demanding on its actors and the Rise cast rose to the occasion, especially Alyssa Sutherland. I had a good egg on my forehead. <laughs> I banged my head on the camera. The mouth blood was like, okay, that is what it is. But the vomit rig was like having somebody else's saliva in your mouth. Ugh. All the actors were encouraged to endure by someone who'd already been there and bled that. You're gonna look back and go, I'm glad I did it. Out in the hall, Beth picks up Mr. Fonda's shotgun to blow their way onto the fire escape, but Ellie comes back. Oh, and there goes her leg. I mean, yeah, that, that'll slow her down. Too bad she's got a whole squad of the evil mostly dead to give Mommy Deadite their usual pep rally. Dead by dawn! <laughs> Dead by dawn! They've had 
thousands of years. You'd think they'd come up with a couple more slogans by now. Cassie grabs the keys and Beth grabs the Cassie, taking refuge in the elevator, which is unfortunately out of order. Like, you know, really out of order. As the elevator starts to fill way past its blood limit, the rest of the fam starts a violent cuddle pile. They shunt themselves together into a hideous amalgamation foretold by the Necronomicon. The Marauder! Beth is up to her neck in blood when the Marauder comes maraudering, but the added weight causes the elevator to break. Capacity limits are no joke, folks. Then we cut to this shot, and I'm like, okay, I, I guess we're doing this, huh? Yep, there it is. But at least this shining reference relishes in the blood spill. They used a lot of blood, and they're ensuring we see it all from every possible angle. This stunt was only filmed a single time with multiple cameras, since it would have taken eight hours to clean and reset for a second take. It's the most obvious of many reasons production builds showers on set to keep the actors from getting too sticky to move. With their fall cushioned by most of the 6,500 liters of blood used for this movie, Beth and Cassie hurry to the family truckster, and in a refreshing twist, the engine starts just fine. Too bad the garage door takes forever, and the Marauder is here to capitalize. Evil Dead Rise was shot in order and hit with an eight-week COVID shutdown early in this sequence. The pause allowed Cronin and the effects team to rethink his many-headed monster of a metaphor. At a deeper level with this movie, it's the worst version of family you could imagine. Depending on the shot, the Marauder used a physical suit occupied by multiple actors contorting in unison, or each actor shot separately with motion-synced cameras, which were then combined in post. Whatever the method, it was a gamble on a relatively meager $19 million budget. It took about a day per Marauder shot almost in the movie. It ate up a hell of a lot of time. I can't say I love the Marauder, but hey, I, I guess it's something new at least. After a quick game of Ring Around the Buick, Beth makes a break for freedom, but six legs are faster than two tiny ones, so the Marauder welcomes Cassie back to the family. It drags her to a tree trimming truck that was established earlier during the earthquake. The composite is about to trim the kid's chubby little cheeks until Beth hits it with a one-liner. Come get some. It whips the chainsaw at her and upgrades its weapon to the wood chipper, but Cassie's a quick study and turns the machine off, allowing her favorite aunt to turn the tables. Beth forces the Marauder into the blades and gives Ellie a Black and Decker migraine. With violent finality, she says goodbye to what's left of her big sis, her niece, and her nephew. Beth takes Cassie hand in saw and triumphantly walks, uh, uh, what, to a hotel, I guess? But don't forget, this movie took place one day before that cold opening, which is why back in the garage, we see the ill-fated Jessica talking to her cousin about their cabin trip. She doesn't notice the liquid ton of blood lying around until it's too late, and Hell's camera operators claims another soul. I stayed up all night counting these kills, so let's see how many I got when I was dead meat by dawn. And you know where we're going for that. Twelve people died and or turned into deadites at Evil Dead Rise. Of those, six were unpossessed men, three were unpossessed women, one was a deadite dude, and two were deadite dudettes. That gives us a good old fashioned quad pie, and also makes this the deadliest Evil Dead movie that didn't, you know, include a skeleton war. Those bastards. With a runtime of 96 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every eight minutes even. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the Marauder, because come on now, it got chainsawed and then it got wood chipped, which is like an industrial strength super deluxe chainsaw. That's groovy as hell. Dom machete for lamest kill goes to Danny, I guess, since he was just stabbed a few times, which isn't all that special compared to everything else going on. And that's it. Evil Dead Rise was supposed to go straight to streaming on HBO Max, but reactions at test screenings led to a theatrical release where it became the highest grossing movie in the series. Raymond Campbell said they're hoping to make another movie every two to three years now, but until the Evil Dead Rise again, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count on Evil Dead Rise. Y'all, this weekend, it's finally here. In two days, on Sunday, is the second Horror Royal Rumble. Please make sure you check it out. It is one of my favorite things we do on this channel now. If you still don't know what I'm talking about, Chelsea creates 30 horror characters in the latest WWE game, and then we run a computer simulated match where they all fight each other and try to throw each other out of the ring. We also give them all really cool entrances with music, and then Chelsea and I commentate over the entire thing. And we don't even know who's gonna win when we're, when we're watching it. We're watching it for the first time and commenting on it. It's so much fun, it marries our love of wrestling and horror in the best way possible. And it's a celebration of so many of the movies and characters we've seen on this channel. That's Sunday, January 22nd, do it, the second Horror Royal Rumble. I wanna thank some patrons like Shadow, Austin Roach, Caleb Cross, Claudio, Cool Galman, Guillermo Claveron, Ian Fenner, and Jace Fitzgibbon. Thanks everyone, be good people.